Good day to you. Good to be with you tonight. We're going to look uh, at the second part of John chapter 3. We're going to look and, and see what is said about basically Jesus and his disciples when they left Galilee. They went uh, and went back towards uh, Judah. Uh, in verse 22, we'd like to start reading there. It says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judah. And there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing uh, near Salem because there was much water there. And the people was coming and was being baptized because this was for John had not yet been thrown into prison. I want to bring out something that's not major important, but something that tickles me every time I get to this verse. When I first began preaching in, in Kansas as a young man and went out, I studied with a lot of people that year or four years I was there in Sublette. But I can remember one young man who was a teacher. And I was studying with him. It's his first teaching uh, position, my first preaching position, and he was not a member of the Lord's Church. And I started studying with him and talking to him, and, and we talked about, and I talked to him about baptism and what baptism was. He was raised in a group that practiced sprinkling. And he just didn't see the importance, the understanding. He couldn't, he couldn't grasp the idea of immersion. And I tried to teach him, and finally, uh, we stopped the study, but I told him to keep a Bible that I gave him. I said, I'd like for you to read this Bible. It wasn't but a, a few weeks. He came down the, into my office. He opened the church, came down into my office. He said, Carter, now I understand what baptism is, what and why it's immersion. I said, well, what did you read? Did you get to Romans? What did you? He said, no, it's, it's right here in John, John chapter 3, because... We, he looked at that and because it said it was there. They was being baptized of him. Why? Well, because John was baptizing there. And why? Because there was much water there. There was much water there. It says, therefore, uh, there was a, a discussion on the part of John disciples and the Jews about uh, purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So they was being baptized because there was much water there in, 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 the, in this place. Much water. Not only much water, there was much baptism being done. Because John was being baptized, all account that I read of John's baptism is that John practiced the baptism himself. When people came to him, we see no emphasis or no record of anybody else baptizing there with John. But John was baptizing people over and over and over again. Now it says here that when they came, Jesus was also, but notice in John chapter 4 and verse 2, it says that Jesus was baptizing, but not he himself, but his his disciples. The apostles was baptizing, not Jesus. It's kind of, um, I think, ironic that here Jesus uh, followed John, but Jesus did not practice the way that John did. John baptized himself. He was preparing the way for someone else, but Jesus allowed others to baptize. And they was doing this and notice it said this. It wrote a discussion. We saw this. And they came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he, bapt he is baptizing in all country, and all are coming to him. Wow. All are coming to him. I don't know if there may have been in John's disciples or the Pharisees or whatever it was, maybe there was some kind of a jealousy because this is my preacher. 
<laughs> this is my preacher. And then other people coming to that preacher or rabbi. But see, John answered and said to them, and because it didn't upset him, and it should, they should have known that, said that one that you had, you had declared to us. But he explains it, I think, so well. Jesus, I mean, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourself are my witness that I said. He said, you are my witness. He was talking to, I think, the Pharisee and his disciple that was discussing that came to him. He said, I said, you are my witness. I am not the Christ, but I have been set ahead of him. He was not the Christ. He was not the Christ. He said, I have said this. I'm sent ahead of him. In verse 29, he says, he who, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. I think we know who that bridegroom was. That bridegroom that he was talking about was, was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the one. He was, we sometimes use the term today, the weddings of, of the best man. Well, in many ways, he was the best man for, for, for Jesus. He was introducing he was that man that was standing up for and with Jesus. He said, this is he. It says, so that the joy of mine had been made full. What? So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must what? Decrease. Now we look at this. And we need to think about something as a, as a Christian, as a preacher. A lot of preachers, a lot of Christians don't get this. Now listen. It says here, you know, but I must decrease. Can we decrease? Can we decrease? We need to decrease in the sense that it's not the importance that of, of us, but it's the importance of Christ. Too many times we have men that boast of themselves instead of boasting of the bridegroom. It's not about it's not about those of us that goes out and we teach and all this, but it's not even like John. John is saying what is important is the bridegroom. And we know later on we see that bridegroom is and talked about is that bride is Christ. Christ came and established his church. It says, he who came from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. That he have seen and heard. Of this he testified and no one received his testimony. He who receives his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Now what he who receive his testimony, if we receive the testimony of Christ, then we have to set our seal. Something, what does it mean set our seal? A seal is, think of the word that we use that sound almost like it signature <laughs> we have a signature when we have a signature when we write a check to someone and we put our seal on it we put our signature on it we are testifying and we put our seal and we have to put our seal to this that God is true the first thing before we can become a Christian before we can even believe in Christ, we have to realize that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For he giveth the Spirit without measure. 
we could go in later on, I hope on a Wednesday night, we would talk about the Spirit and how it was given. The Spirit is given to us in measures in the sense that we do not have the ability the apostles did. And they did not have, they did not have the power of the Holy Spirit as Christ did. Verse 35, it says, The Father loves the Son and has given has given all things unto his hand. He has given him all things unto his hand. And he can hand to those that he wants. He chooses. He has the power. He's the, some have said, well, he's, I've heard this term when I was growing up in Oklahoma. He's my right hand man. He's my right hand man. When we look at Jesus. God in heaven spoken of in Revelation of the places he is talked about as being at the right hand of the throne of uh, the throne of heaven the throne of God it says he who believes in the son has has eternal life but he who does not obey the son would not seek see life but the wrath of God abideth on him now, this is, this is very interesting. Here in verse 20, 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. And I'm reading from one of the versions, the American Standard Version, which I think is the most accurate English version that we have. But it says, But he who does not obey the, the Son will not see life. Some of the versions says, He who does not have faith in the Son will not see life. Now that faith is an action faith. An action faith. And it says if we don't, then what? So if, if you don't, if we believe on Him, but if we do not have faith, what it's talking about is believing is one thing. Acting out that, that faith is, is obedience. Some have said, the Son, we have to believe in Him, but then we have to do something. I was trying to think of an illustration, and the one that came to my mind was when I was a scout leader back even there in Kansas. We would go up to the uh, Colorado Mountains to camp several summers. I went up there with the boys. And the boys, so oftentimes they wanted to be and, and take trails and, and win merit badges. One of the things they do, they would find a leader that would take them and said, now we're going to follow a trail. We're going to go on a hiking trail. They had different levers. They said, I'm going to go before you, and I'm going to leave marks on the trail. And you are to go, and you are to follow me. And you know, we think about that. They followed him. Well, they followed that leader after he was gone. But they found that mark. They was following him. They believed what he said, and he left them a way to go. Now, would they have followed and believed in him if they decided, hey, I'm going to take a shortcut to get to some place? No, they knew they needed to stay on the walk, the trail. Jesus, we have to have faith. We have to have faith that he lived. We have to have faith that he lived, that he died. He rose again. He's at the right hand of the throne of God. But also we have to, we have, to have faith in the sense that he told us not to add to or take away from the words of this book. That is, we are to do it. That's what it says in Revelation, not to add to or take away. And so we are to have that faith that's an obedient faith in God. And if we do that, then we will get, <laughs> it's going to sound funny, there will be trails that those boys would follow. The boys would follow the trail, but they always would come back to home base, a home camp. But they came different ways, past different sceneries, different rocks, different trees, different cliffs. 
and they had to follow the trail. The master, the scout master, left for them, and they would make it home. If we follow the trail that the master left for us, then we will make it home. God be with you till we meet again.